this presentation and just a couple of housekeeping things. I normally have this to be very uh, interactive, but it's a little hard to do in this setting. So, you know, please keep your, uh, if you can't remember a, uh, a question, I think there is a, uh, a comment tab. So just type your questions there and uh, we'll go back through and, and check those later. Or obviously we can ask after the presentation. Um, and um, as a first step, as an attorney, I have to tell you this, that uh, th uh, this, this presentation does not create an attorney-client uh, relationship between us. So it's really for information and educational purposes. Uh, so everything in here, um, it, this actually, it actually is a teaching moment a copyright notice. You don't actually see them everywhere anymore. Uh, and the thing is not required to show a copyright notice. Copyright exists whether or not a copyright notice is placed anywhere. So for me, putting this up here tells you, well, one, who owns the copyright, which is me, when the work was created, uh, and uh, any limitations I've put on the work that I've created. In this case, uh, you may uh, pass this on uh, for non-commercial purposes, uh but um you know if you do want to use it you know make reference to me i'm happy for you to do that and that's totally fine as long as uh the copyright information is there uh the thing about copyright and the stuff that i'm putting in here it's all generally public domain stuff but what is protected is the way i'm presenting it and i'll talk to you a little bit about that as we as we go along so primarily when we talk about uh, the creative sphere, um, intellectual property aspects, you know, really cover the whole range, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. But more importantly, copyright law is then to be the biggest thing that usually comes into play. Uh, and, and we're gonna focus on that because frankly, all the questions I got uh, prior to this presentation were around copyright. Uh, and copyright is probably one of the more misunderstood uh, things about intellectual property in a creative realm, mainly because people think they know what copyright law is, but they really don't. Um, and that's that's also true of lawyers. Uh, uh, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've gotten things from uh, from other lawyers who are not intellectual property practitioners. And I've said, looked at some of the letters and said, you don't really understand what the, what the law says here. So uh, copyright law in and of itself is actually enshrined in the constitution. Uh, in fact, article one, section eight, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of sciences and the useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors, the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. So, you know, this is, it's, it's right there. You know, it, you, this is the law of the land. And, and the reason that it, it, it's come uh, came into being, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, was to try to help uh, people get some uh, remuneration for what they're doing, trying to encourage them to create. Um, you know, and it goes back hundreds of years. If you follow American history and legal systems, it goes back to, of course, the British system uh, and the distillation of the British common law into copyright uh, has a very significant social and community uh, aspect to it. So generally, what is copyrightable? And the law basically says that uh, a, a work is copyrightable if it is an original work of authorship that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. There's those three things. Uh, so what does that mean? what is an original work an original work is basically something that is independently created that means that it's not copied so for example some of you may be taking notes uh and since we're all in different places assuming you guys haven't copied your notes even if your notes are uh exact word for word copies of each other well copies is another word uh, uh duplicates of each other as long as they're not copied you have an independent copyright in that work more an easier example um you can you actually see this from time to time uh um uh for example jk rowling after uh, harry potter came out there was a slew of copyright cases that came out alleging that uh, jk rowling uh copied the concept of of harry potter but if if you can show 
that she didn't have any access to the work and created independently, there's no copyright infringement because of an original work. There has to be some minimal degree of creativity. So for example, geometric shapes on and of themselves are not original. Uh, there was actually, when the smiley face came out uh, in the 70s, there was some question about whether or not the smiley face in it itself is creative enough. Uh, and, and the answer is yes, because the, the amount of creativity that came into that, you know, there was clearly nothing that came before it that was quite like it. Um, so it's a case by case basis. The other thing about it is that the copyright only protects expressions. So and not facts. And what that means is, so if you're writing a newspaper article, the facts presented in that newspaper article are not protected by copyright, but the way those facts are described and expressed is protected by copyright. So some way to look at that is to say, uh, you know, if you look at a, a news, newspaper source or a news source and see, is it biased in some way? Well, the, the description that's in that text of a particular event is that expression that's protected, but not the events themselves. So um, uh, the, another way to look at this is say I, I asked several of you to create a uh, painting of a safari scene. Uh, the things that are related to that scene are not protectable. So if some of you have zebras and lions, the fact that you have zebras and lions is not protectable. Uh, say you both have, two, two of you have the same number of zebras and the same number of lions is besides the point because the idea of zebras and lions is not protectable. But the way you draw them, the way you paint them, uh, your expression of that scene is protectable. There's also no protection in forms. Uh, and uh, and no protection on ideas. So when I say forms, I mean like uh, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you, you go to the DMV and you fill out form PA 103X to get your driver's license. The way that form is arranged, there is no protection in that. And ideas are not protectable by copyright. Ideas are protectable by patents. Uh, and so, so for example, um, I often get people saying, Oh, I've got this great idea. What's the copyright in the idea? There is no copyright in the idea. There's a copyright in the way you describe that idea, but the actual whatever the idea is is not protectable by copyright. And it'll you can get this a little bit under uh, uh, better understood as we go along. But essentially, original expressions that are works of authorship. Uh, now, <laughs> what, what are works of authorship? The, this is a little, probably the more technical aspect of it. Uh, the copyright law defines one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine divisions uh, of what constitutes a work of authorship. So there are literary works, which are basically writings, uh, novels, articles, anything written, the written word. Uh, musical works, including accompanying words. So, you know, let's come up with a song, write the lyrics. Um, then dramatic works would be plays uh, and any music that it might be in there. Pantomime and choreographic works, which includes uh, dance steps and things like that. Uh, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works would be photographs, sculptures, uh, paintings, drawings, things like that. Motion pictures and audiovisual works would be movies and things like that. Sound recordings, yeah, sound recordings. Uh, and architectural works, which would be drawings of buildings and such. So here's an interesting thing with this uh, listing is that some works have multiple tiers of copyright. So the motion picture, uh, a movie has, you know, you have the script. You also have the, uh, if there's a DVD, the DVD cover has, you know, graphics on that will be a different uh, type of cop copyright. And then any um, music that's included in there uh, would be a separate copyright, and and so you can actually have uh, multiple works of copyright in one single work. And generally, if, when you do have those multiple tiers, uh, you can actually uh, pick one of those tiers and and save a little money in registration. I'll explain that a little bit uh, uh, a little for a little later. Another interesting thing about architectural works is that. 
if a building or a work has uh, architectural drawings and a building is constructed following those architectural works, uh, then the building itself is subject to copyright protection. And there are actually instances when, uh, right after the towers fell in 9-11, uh, uh, where the, po the police were actually stopping people from taking pictures of the buildings around there because some of the um, architects of the skyscrapers uh, were actually sending cease and desist uh, 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 notices to uh, third parties that were taking pictures of the buildings without their permission. So that is something to be uh, be aware of. So it's a again we can talk about that a little bit as you go on. So we said there were three things. It was an original work of authorship that's fixed in a tangible medium. So what does that mean? A fixed work is basically something that uh, that is stable enough. Uh, the Letcher Law says to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period of more than transitory duration. So. For example, if we were having this presentation in, uh, in, in, well, live in person uh, and it wasn't being recorded, uh, there, there would be no copyright in my presentation because what I was saying was not being fixed in a tangible medium. But now because we are in Zoom and P uh, Patrick is in fact recording this for later reproduction, there is copyright. It's simple as that. Um, so uh, a wrinkle with that was that it used to be that um, was live TV recordings, well, live TV broadcasts, was that fixed? Uh, and um, the courts have said that live broadcasts are fixed within the meaning of, of the law. And this is a moving target. So if somebody figures out a new way to fix something, like, again, if we were, if we were in person having this presentation, and somebody figured out a way to, to grab brainwaves <laughs> and record those and, and make that a tangible way of, of recording an expression, then it would be a copyrightable um, presentation. But right now, uh, because we're in Zoom, it is, but if we were in person, it wouldn't be unless somebody were recording it. Uh, so you plot a phone and then um, the um, recording becomes cop subject to copyright. So, what are tangible means of expressions? Print, clay, screen, electronic magnetic storage. So basically emails, um, you know, that actually counts. And things that's transmitted and any other means now in existence or later developed. So like I talked about, somebody recording brainwaves would make, make that fixed. So there's a, there's a couple of things um, that copyright does. So there's, there's two, distinctions between the owner of a copyright and the creator of a copyright. Um, because somebody who creates something doesn't necessarily own that right. They could either sell that copyright to somebody else, uh, or they may not actually have the right uh, to control uh, a work. So an owner of a copyright uh, has the right to, one, well, make copies, <laughs> copyright. Uh, the second one, prepared derivative works, that is a very um, tricky one. That one comes up a lot because um, uh, and a, a lot of people will look at uh, creating derivative works as generally paying a homage to an original work. But that's a very fine line from homage and derivative works. Uh, and depending on how, <laughs> How much you annoy the original copyright owner, that can get people in trouble. Uh, now, derivative works are supposed to be uh, uh, the the way the law says it that a derivative work is a work that is based uh, in whole or in part on a pre-existing work. So that's a pretty broad definition. So uh, we do get a lot of issues with, for example, Disney coming in and telling people you can't use. Uh, um, Mickey Mouse in in any of your works, and in fact, I was just reading about the uh, uh, hashtag um, Fourth of May, May the Fourth be with you. Uh, uh, I'm coming up where Disney was at, preemptively tried to claim copyright uh, or tried to claim a license to 
fan postings using the hashtag May the Fourth. Um, and they're not going to win on that, but uh, the uh, there are people with resources that will try to uh, control uh, their copyright uh, and make sure that anyone making derivative works that are not within their purview uh, are, are basically controlled and and uh, and held in place. So. Uh, this is where we are going to get a lot of issues uh, with um, uh, infringement and uh, how do you define what, what is new and what is copied. Uh, so the third one is uh, obviously distribute copies to the public. Uh, and the last one is perform or display works uh, for musical things. Um, now authors, so someone who creates something, uh, have, has the right to claim authorship of their work. So if you create something and you um, uh, sell the copyright to the work, but not the work itself. So there's a, there's a distinction between, and we'll get to this a little bit, selling a copy of a work and selling the copyright to that work. Um, an author, no matter what, can claim authorship for their work as a right of attribution. So no one can say, uh, that if you've created something that, oh, I created that instead. Uh, prevent the use of their names of the author and the work they did not create, which is a negative right. So nobody can say, well, I created some because of my fame, somebody uses my name <laughs> in uh, in another work. Uh, I can prevent that uh, assertion because when I didn't create it. Uh, you also can use, uh, prevent your name being used for work that's a distortion of yours. So if I create this, this uh, presentation and I, uh, somebody on a whim comes in and changes this work and the facts are wrong, uh, that clearly might harm my reputation and I can stop people from, from disseminating that copy of this presentation. So, uh, preventing intentional distortion, mutilation, or the modification, and destruction of the work if it has recognizable stature. This is um, a variation on the um, uh, visual artist rights, which we'll actually talk about in a little bit. Uh, the Europeans actually have a more um, robust uh, set of moral rights for authorship than the Americans do. Uh, so, uh, you do not see these authorship claims really well enforced. Uh, and when it does happen, it usually is for works that are of substantial nature uh, or of uh, creators that are really well known. Uh, generally everyday uh, creations, creators, just really everybody, don't tend to uh, enforce these rights of, uh, of authorship. So, um, the thing about copyright uh, is, is uh, that it does allow multiple uh, authors to combine, to jointly contribute to single copyright. So uh, if you have uh, works, books that are put, uh, put together by two people, both authors must have an intent, intention to merge the contents into a single work. So uh, there'll be a single copyright for one work, even though there are multiple authors. And, and in that sense, every, uh, author is considered an author for purposes of copyright law. Um, now, this doesn't mean that they're necessarily owners, but you have authors that can have all of the rights that we talked about here, that they can claim the authorship and make all of these um, assertions of authorship. Now, ownership. <laughs> as distinct from authorship. The default is the author is, is by default considered the owner of the work that's created. However, two caveats. If an, if an author is employed by somebody, they are not considered the author. The employees uh, have uh, essentially given up the right to be an author if they create something within the scope of their employment. And in, in that case, the employer is considered to be the author of any work created by an employee. So if you're working for 
an organization and and your boss uh, and it is within the scope for your boss to tell you to create something you are not the author of that work the company is it's not even your supervisor or the boss or the owner of the company it is the company independent contractors who are not employees are authors of works that are created for somebody else so if there's no employer employee relationship you're an independent contractor you're not getting um you know taxes pulled out or uh, uh or benefits or anything like that you're you know um not a part of the structure of a, co of a company you're considered an independent contractor you're you are the author of your of the work that's created or your company <laughs> um so what this means is for example if you go uh and have somebody create your website for you um and they you don't control them they're their own person they're their own company uh if there is not something in writing that says that the copyright's being transferred to you that person or that company owns the copyright in that work um even if there is a uh, a writing that says that the that the website is transferred to you if that website includes photographs that are not created by you or them but or by third parties those photographs are not transferred and copyright uh, to you so so for example if you go to sears and well sears, sears doesn't exist anymore you go to the picture place and get your pictures taken you don't own the copyright in those pictures the picture place does i don't even know if the picture place is still open well anyway <laughs> you go to a place to get pictures taken so you're almost always better off if if ownership and control of a work or a photograph is important to you take your own pictures <laughs> one <laughs> or two you're getting somebody else to get the, to to take those pic to take those pictures for you make sure you get the copyright transferred to you and also well three the upshot of that if you're doing that uh is be ready to pay for it uh because generally uh you don't um you don't transfer the copyright in, in some things unless you ask for it uh, and a lot of creatives uh, who do uh, work in, in photography do want to be able to control and use their works that they create uh, as um, examples uh, in their portfolio for other work maybe they, they like a particularly great shot that they took and maybe they touch it up and make it into another work of art so if you are going to go with somebody who is uh, has a good reputation a good name and a good eye be ready to pay for the copyright to be transferred to you um and you know from a from a creative side of point of view uh it is a way to tier uh rates so if somebody says to you um hires you to take photographs and say well you're my rate for uh, limp, uh, uh for just the pictures with no copyright is is this my rate for uh pictures with a limited a distribution license is this if you want the entire copyright it's that so you can tier your structure uh so that you can actually get paid for one what you what you want uh two what you what you basically deserve uh and and three it it helps you have a commute have a line of communication with your uh customers i mean you really do need to have uh an open discussion about what the expectations are and if you spring on 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 somebody uh, uh, that you know they not getting what they what they thought they were, then that generally is a bad taste in people's mouth. Uh, people generally, and 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 this has been my experience, is that they generally think, well, I paid for this, so I should own this. And the answer is no, you don't, because copyright law does not allow you to transfer copyright without something in writing. Um, now that's different in different countries for so for example if you go to canada you 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 pay for a photograph the copyright is transferred with that payment uh one way to to, to do that in the u.s is one have a well you need a contract uh and and two uh usually that contract will say we won't transfer the copyright to you until you pay us whatever the rate is so uh and when i work with a lot of web developers that's how they'll do it uh, they'll say, you know, we're gonna. Uh, here's the payment scheme. Here's the payment structure. Uh, when once the website is delivered and you accept it, 
and you make our final payment, payment that's when copyright transfers over to you. Um, so ownership is a very thorny and picky thing. And, uh, you know, ownership cannot be just given away uh, with that by, by just saying it. You actually have to have a writing that makes it clear that the parties are actually transferring ownership. Uh, otherwise, um, without, uh, that's different than a license. Uh, telling somebody that you can use a work and, and share it does not require you to have a writing because essentially uh, the, the courts have said that uh, people are allowed to behave in a way that makes clear their intention without giving up their ownership. So if you post something on, for example, social media, you're not giving Facebook or TikTok or whatever, the copyright to your work, you're giving them a license to use the work within within the um, within that social media platform for limited purposes that are determined in the terms of use of that of that particular platform. The problem tends to be, however, that the other users forget that. The other users generally don't know what those limitations are and generally don't understand that just because something's on 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 the internet that doesn't mean that they're allowed to uh copy and download and disseminate uh at all and that and that becomes very difficult for creators so how do you how do you stop that how do you stop others from uh taking the works that you've put on there to share uh and there are several strategies of course uh one of the major ones of course is you know watermarking <laughs> or uh putting in in the comments or notes uh, the, the retention of copyright, uh, or, you know, just making sure that your followers and people you, you, if you're a creative, uh, understand the limitations of what you're trying to do that, you know, you're, you're creating something that is, uh, that you're trying to survive on, trying to live on, you're trying to make a living on. Uh, and the, the more, uh, fervent your followers are, uh, the more likely you are to be able to enforce your copyright because the people who follow you want to see you succeed. Uh, and they tend to be the ones who will help you um, police your own works. Uh, and I, I see that time and time again. Uh, you know, it's not always successful uh, and it is a constant battle for ownership. Uh, but, you know, it is something that can happen. And it doesn't happen right away. It happens with time. If you do things consistently and you create an ownership or create a following that that trusts what you're creating, uh, it, it it becomes self-policing. So there's a lot of work that goes into establishing yourself and establishing your work and making it um, recognizable. It's getting better, but it's not 100% um, by far. So generally, copyrights are an asset, like all intellectual property. They can be bought, sold, put in the will, licensed uh, in whole or in part. Uh, they can be, you know, I, uh, I can say I'm, I give, you know, half of my copyright in my presentation to my wife. Uh, although, well, she already has that because she's my wife. Um, to somebody else, <laughs> to Patrick, because I like Patrick. Um, and then if, if he decides to make and sell this um, uh, presentation, uh, and monetize it, then he would have to actually report to me. Uh, it can be whole, yeah, multiple parties, uh, but they are true graphic in scope. Uh, like all intellectual property, um, it's only going to be enforced in, in those countries. Each country has their own rules for how uh, intellectual property is, is uh, enforced, what the scopes and limits are. So for example, uh, the term of copyright in the U.S. is much longer than it is in most other countries. Uh, the the works of Arthur Conan, Conan Doyle for like uh, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes are already off copyright in Canada and the U.K., but they're still in copyright in the U.S. Um, so that is something to be generally that generally most people don't really have to worry about. Uh, but if you're a larger company working overseas, uh, which I do have some issues uh, just come up, uh, you do have to con be concerned about that. So, for example, um, uh, Erie's Manufacturing is one of my clients. They have a whole bunch of photographs 
of works that they use on their website that are being copied in China. In the US, registration isn't required for your copyrights to be valid, and I'll talk about it a little further. But in China, they are. So if you don't have a registration of a copyright in, in China, you can't enforce the copyright in China. Uh, so the, there becomes a whole cost issue that uh, uh, that comes into play with with uh, with the geography, um, you know, and 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 generally, it really comes down to philosophy about intellectual property. Uh, for in the U.S., since it's a constitutional right, uh, we take it a little bit more seriously, uh, and we do err in favor of granting the owner of copyrights more rights than than not. Unfortunately, our economic system being what it is, that generally means that uh, if you have more resources to be able to enforce that, you're generally going to win. Uh, welcome to America. So um, as I mentioned before, all transfers of exclusive rights must be in writing. Um, so if I transfer my copyright entirely to you, it has to be in writing. In part, it has to be in writing. Uh, uh, a license that is less than exclusive does not have to be in writing. Um, so uh, since I earlier gave all of you the a license to use my presentation, uh, it's a non-exclusive right. That means each anyone can, can do it. It doesn't have to be in writing. So, um, the Visual Artist Rights Act in 1990 uh, protects certain visual works. And this is sort of similar to what I talked about earlier about what some of the rights that um, um, authors have in general. The, the problem with, with the moral rights in the US is that it really requires that the work have some recognizable stature. Uh, and there is nothing in the, in the law that says that there's a particular time period with, within which uh, authors can uh, can can prevent the destruction of their works. Um, so generally, what what it requires authors to do is to be vigilant. Uh, is to is to is to understand that the works that they're creating, they may not be able to have control over them if if they created a work uh, that is out in the universe. So you create a painting and you sell it. You're not selling the copyright in that painting but you're selling but you're giving up your ability to control what happens to that work um so for example um, which doesn't quite fit in this category but um uh, you can think about it as the difference between buying a book a copy of a book and buying the copyright to that book so just because i have you know, three copies of the entire Harry Potter series doesn't mean that I own the ability to, to say that I wrote <laughs> the Harry Potter series. I have a copy of the book. Well, two of them actually. Um, and um, that gives me no right to claim authorship, gives me no right to copy and distribute the book. But by the same token, J.K. Rowling's can't stop me from doing what I want with the book itself. If I burn the book, she's got no harm done. If I give the book away, nothing she can do about it. If I give it to a library to lend it to a friend, nothing they can do about it because the book that I have in my hand is different than the copyright in that work. Because when I bought that book, I did not buy the copyright to the work. I just bought a copy of the work that I can do it, what I want with. Well within reason other than, you know, I can't create a derivative work based on it, which raises another question about fan fiction and, and things like that. So I like Harry Potter, uh, say I write, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't be the only one, but uh, I, I don't, but other people do uh, write stories that are based in the Harry Potter universe those technically are derivative works of the original Harry Potter work. Technically, J.K. Rowling's could stop me from creating those works. 
because they are, we are, those fan fictions are taking the works of others and creating a derivative work based on that. They could very easily have done a brand new story, a whole new world, a whole new whatever, but they chose not to. They chose to take an existing work and for whatever reason, uh, homage, uh, creativity, whatever, have created that derivative work. That actually is a copyright violation. So the dirty little secret about intellectual property is that it really is only as good as the owner chooses to enforce. And if the owner chooses not to enforce its copyright with respect to a particular work, there's nothing anyone else can do. You can see copyright violations, intellectual property violations all over the place. And you can, you can have your own moral outrage about it, but it's not up to you uh, to protect somebody else's copyright. The best you can do is, is notify the owners if you'd like, uh, but it's really up to them to choose to enforce. Uh, there are some owners that are obviously a lot more um, able and willing to enforce their copyrights. Disney comes to mind. Getty Images also used to come to mind. Um, and uh, they tend to be the larger organizations that, that have the ability to police uh, and enforce their rights that that will usually come up with and, and claim uh, uh, copyright infringement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when it comes up to infringement. So um, joint ownership as distinct from joint authorship. So, you know, I've said that you could uh, uh, distribute the copyright in whole or apart. So, uh, an excellent example is the uh, uh, the uh, catalog by the Beatles. Right, the the four of the the four Beatles uh, have joint ownership in the works that they created. Uh, so there's four of them. Um, they are each owner is a full owner of the whole work, uh, and each owner must account to the other owner. So uh, if John Paul Ringo. Uh, and George, you know, the Beatles no longer, ex well, some of them are dead, uh, but um, they may independently dispose of their interests in any way that, that they like without accounting to the other owners for the sale of their ownership interest. But they do have to account to the other owners for what they do uh, with the profits that they that they garner from the exploitation of that work, so if there's no agreement between the between the four of them to actually coordinate how they they uh, uh, profit from their catalog. They could each individually do what they want with it, and there's nothing that the other person could do. However, the Beatles are they of course they have lawyers, so they've done it so that uh, they've actually sold all their rights to. Um, uh, Apple Core uh, Studios. So, uh, and that Apple Core Studios distributes the, their own their profits amongst the four of them, and their estates, because um, because uh, ownership as an asset means that if they if a person dies, uh, the the rights to that work go with the estate. They don't revert to the other owners. Um, so. Um, when 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 uh, when John Lennon passed away, uh, ownership went to uh, Yoko Ono, and possibly his son uh, Julian. It depends on whatever his uh, his will stated. So for each, uh, and this actually comes happens a lot, uh, where there is a uh, catalog of works when an an an, a, uh, uh, an artist passes away, if the a state and the will does not specify who the uh, um, copyright goes to, it will default to what the state law says. Uh, so it could go to, uh, depending on the state, it could go all to a spouse or it could be div divvied up between the, the issue, which would be the children. Uh, or if there's no children, then it would be the next, you know, the next akin, however that's distributed. 
So uh, ownership can get very tricky. Uh, and in fact, I had an instance where I had uh, uh, someone come to me where uh, the person had found a catalog of photographs that were taken from somebody uh, uh, who passed away uh, in um, and just basically took photos of people around the, around town in Erie in the 40s. Uh, and he died without having any kids. However, um, he had several brothers and sisters who had siblings and who had children. Uh, and uh, the brothers and sisters had passed away, but the ownership of the copyright had passed to his nephews and nieces. And 80 years later, there's about a dozen of them spread out across the country. And this person's desire to take those photographs and publish them and distribute them and reprint them would have been violating their copyright. Um, and because he didn't have a, uh, uh, a will to, to just find how that was distributed, uh, that can get pretty complicated. So if you, any of you are, have any amount of uh, uh, creativity or making uh, any amount of profit from whatever it is you're creating, make sure your wills do specify what happens to your work and what happens to the copyright in your work. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of um, real estate lawyer, uh, not real, um, um, uh, uh, lawyers who do wills and estates, estate planning, there you go, uh, lawyers are not intellectual property attorneys. And if they haven't come across this issue, they may not bring it up to you. Uh, so you do need to account for that in your uh, estate planning. So how long does copyright last? Well, you can thank Disney for this. Uh, but as of January 1st, 1978, anything that's created lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, and if you've got joint works, it's the, la it's the life of the last surviving author plus 70 years. So for example, um, uh, the Beatles, the Beatles, <laughs> Paul McCartney is still alive. Uh, uh, John and um, George has passed away, but uh, the term of copyright for the Beatles catalog in the United States will be after the last surviving Beatle passes away plus 70 years after that. Um, yes, that's very long. It used to be a lot uh, shorter than that. It used to be 14 years. Uh, and then um, Disney came along uh, oof, by the turn of the early 1900s, um, went to Congress, and there are actually records of this. Uh, it repeatedly went back to Congress to try to extend that. So it went from 14 years to 28 years, 28 years extendable for another 28 years, and then finally the life of the author plus 70 years, which means that now finally um, uh, Steamboat Willie, uh, which is the precursor to Mickey Mouse, is finally off copyright. But for the longest time, Disney would uh, actually go to Congress and extend the, the term of copyright to what it is now. Honestly, I think uh, this is probably um, one of the biggest stumbling blocks to innovation and uh, creativity, uh, because on one hand, uh, yeah, if you're a small uh, artist, uh, great. You can you have that protection for a really long time. But how do you start? You I mean you start by getting uh, inspiration and paying homage to what comes before you. And if you're not careful, everything that you're doing to work up to develop your art becomes a copyright violation. Uh, and you have to be very careful about where you draw that line between. Uh, homage and in infringement. And this one piece of protection, I, I think, does more to stifle that than anything else. I mean, look at patents. Patents are only really valid for 20 years. Uh, trademarks are only really valid for as long as a company or a person is using them in commerce. But copyright, yeah, you don't have to do anything and it's still in force for a very, very long time. Um, so, um, there's another type of copyright, which is called a collective work. And that is basically uh, an anthology or a collection, uh, which has multiple contributors assembled into a collective whole. So 
uh, if you look at Isaac Asimov's uh, collection of short stories, well, he, they come out, well, his foundation comes out, well, every year with an Isaac Asimov's sci-fi anthology of 20 whatever, uh, although even though he's dead. Um, each of the individual short stories in that work uh, are separate copyright, but there is a uh, copyright in the collection of putting those works together. So there's a whole uh, bit of that. This is useful in, um, for example, um, say you're a photographer uh, and you have thousands of photographs that you take every month, every year, uh, and you could be, you do have individual copyright in each, every, each and every single photograph that you take, but that can get clumsy and clunky. If you collect all of those photographs into a work and say, into a single work and say, um, here's my, create, my creative catalog from 20, 2019, that's one copyright for the entire work, as opposed to, which also includes individual copyrights for every single work that's in there. Um, uh, and the reason this is important is when it comes to registration of copyrights, um, you actually in the US, if you register a copyright, you can actually get a separate registration for every single thing that you create. Or you can collect it all in one work and that still counts. Uh, so um, we talked about this a little uh, before um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, uh so when do you create something and this relates back to this anthology in that uh if you um if you're creating you're getting people to work together on a project uh is the project being done within a scope of employment or is it a collaborative co project or is it a compilation of works uh and all of that means that you have to be very clear uh what the parties intend when a work is being created. Uh, if there's an employee-employee relationship, you almost have no rights as an employee uh, because you are already being paid for your work. If it's being done collaboratively to work together, then uh, you're, you're, that, that has imp implications for what that final product could be. Uh, if it's being done by 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 taking others' works and not putting them, um, and, and putting them in a uh, in a compilation, that ha also has different uh, implications for what happens. Uh, and basically, what what this means is, uh, you need to make sure that you record uh, your intentions, preferably in writing. Uh, does that need to be a formal contract? No, it doesn't. Uh, an email will do, uh, and, and generally what I tell my clients or anybody, uh, if you have, um, uh, if you're talking to somebody, you're working with somebody, you will work with somebody, what does it hurt for you to shoot them an email and say, hey, you know, we spoke about this project that we're going to be working on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I thought we agreed to, this is what you're going to do, this is what I'm going to do, this is the end result. Uh, if there's any money involved, here's how we're getting paid, here's how we're getting reimbursed. Set, uh, end the email by saying, did I say anything incorrectly here? Correct me if I'm wrong. Hit send. Hey, you got a contract. If they respond back and say, yep, that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> that is actually something in writing. And that actually will work to assign copyright too. Uh, because the uh, the courts have basically stated and 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 understood that not everyone has the resources of, of corporations and such, and the fact of the matter is that most people you know just interact uh, within the scope of that's how people work, uh, and contracts can't uh, don't have to be formal for them to be contracts. Uh, so. Be sure you understand what it is you're getting into uh, if you're working with anybody else. Uh, I literally had a conversation with somebody about this very thing yesterday, where they've been working with somebody for years, uh, and things are going great. Uh, but what happens if one of them gets hit by a bus? They don't have anything in writing, so um, you, they probably should. <laughs>
Um, um, well, skip over this part, but essentially, uh, when you're working with somebody else, you really do need to understand uh, uh, whether or not an employer-employee relationship exists. Uh, and unfortunately, this isn't something that is as uh, as obvious as you might think. There's a whole bunch of um, uh, legal, well, I wouldn't say mumbo jumbo, but uh, legal implications for whether or not if somebody's an employee uh, that the that depending on who is in office at the president presidential level actually changes whether or not somebody is an employee. Um, so this is really something that you need to keep keep an eye on, um, at least keep in the back of your mind. Um, but for most instances, you, you're really not going to have to worry about it. Uh, but understand if you have something in writing, that always is better than not. Um, again, we'll skip this as well. So copyright registration. So under US law, you are not required to have a registration to have copyright. It is automatic. Like I said, uh, before. Uh, copyright exists when you have an original work of authorship fixed in the tangible medium. That's it. That's all that's required for copyright to exist. Registration in the U.S. is not required for it. It is best to always have some sort of record um, and generally these days if you, um, you know, send an email uh, or if it's an electronic thing, something that's dated, uh, you have uh, presumptive rights to that to that work as of that date. Um, so um, the copyright law does say that you may mark something with copyright. So that first slide that I had, I didn't have to have that for copyright to be there. Uh, I put this together, copyright exists because I fixed it in tangible medium and I had some creativity in the way I put this together. It's a minimal amount of creativity, but it's there. However, you do need registration if you're going to enforce it in court. Um, so uh, you can send a cease and desist letter out to anyone who's infringing your copyright, um, but you, you are not entitled to collect um, uh, damages or anything like that um, if you can't get them. <laughs> so basically, um, somebody takes your work, you cease, and it's not a it's not a it's not a registered copyright. Uh, you send a cease and desist letter and say, "Pay me X amount of dollars for violating my copyright," because otherwise, I'll take you to court. Um, you are not entitled to get any money back from that. However, you can make it very painful for somebody uh, by. Uh, uh, insisting that they pay you something because taking somebody to court, knowing that you won't get any damages back, doesn't mean it won't be expensive for them because they'll have to hire a lawyer. You'll have to hire a lawyer. Uh, and generally the cost for lawyers getting involved is typically more than the copyright is worth. This used to be the, um, uh, the business model of Getty Images. Uh, where uh, Getty Images, if you don't know, is one of the largest databases of, of uh, photographs and images. Uh, and what they used to do, uh, they they sell they sent sell a lot of images to uh, uh, publications, things like that. Uh, what they used to do is keep an eye on their catalog, and every now and then they will find somebody who's using their. Uh, you can actually very easily get access to the catalog for a very low price uh, if you didn't get that image from them directly, and they found it, they would send you a cease and desist letter and typically ask for two or $3,000, uh, basically enough where uh, it's painful for you, but not enough that it's worth your while to hire somebody to figure out to fight. Um, and they would do that up until maybe about, about 10 years ago. Um, uh, time flies, uh, and um, uh, which it, which raises a very important point that if you are using somebody else's work as part of what you are doing, make sure you get a something in writing showing that you're authorized to use that work. 
because you may get slapped with a cease and desist letter uh, if there is not a chain of ownership showing that, you, yes, I paid for a license to use this work uh, because you could get slammed with, uh, well, cease and desist uh, letter. Um, but uh, going to on the next slide, so how do you how do you do get a registration if that is something you want to do? It's actually pretty easy. Uh, you submit a complete application to the co copyright office, www.copyright.gov, copyright.gov, not copyright.com, uh, which is another site. Um, and uh, you have to submit one or two copies of the work to the Library of Congress, which can be done online, uh, or you can mail something into them. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, you know, it's not that expensive, $35 per work. Um, now, here is where that compilation uh, question comes into, comes into play. If you have a whole slew of things you want to protect under registration, uh, it is better, well, cheaper to uh, file a registration for a compilation of your works uh, and then, uh, so for example, your, 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 your photograph catalog from 2020, uh, 2019, uh, you put it all together in one book or one file and register that. Uh, if somebody were to take one of those photographs and infringe that that copyright, you have a registration uh, for that work in this compilation that you've paid $35 for rather than $35 for every single item in that catalog. Um, so that's, that's one way to, to manage your costs with things like that. Uh, typically, I, I suggest that you, uh, if somebody wants to get a registration done, go look it up yourself and do it yourself because it's really easy to do. Uh, I mean, I could do it, but then I'll charge you my hourly rate and you know, who wants to pay that? Well, I'd like you to pay that, but generally most, most authors, most artists don't have that kind of money. Uh, but once you do it, it's, it's, the, it's pretty easy to do uh, and the website's pretty, um, pretty well um, laid out. Um, but you know, uh, if you have any questions or issues with that, you can always give me a holler and I'll be happy to walk you through it. So infringement. Um, so there's a couple of ways that uh, copyright states how infringement can be done. So um, direct infringement is basically any unauthorized exercise of any of the rights that we've listed earlier. So uh, uh, you have liability, so an infringer has liability to the owner for copying, distribution, all of those things. Potential liabil liability to the author if they you know, misrepresent the authorship and things like that. And most importantly, lack of intent is not a defense. So if you go to YouTube and, and a lot of these other sites, you'll see, oh, um, people making, taking bits and pieces of other people's work and incorporating it and saying, oh, no copyright infringement intended. Uh, th that doesn't matter. It's infringement. <laughs> uh, whether or not you want there to be infringement does not protect you from an allegation of infringement. Uh, you can't take somebody else's work without permission. If you want to incorporate that work, get a license. And, contact the original owner. Um, and, and these days it's easy to do. If it's, if, it's, if, it's a, um, if it's a musical bit you wanna put in your background, uh, the record industry uh, has uh, very easy ways for you to go and get uh, permission from their websites. Um, or go to Google and do a Google search and look for items that are either one, Creative Commons, or two non-commercial free to use items. And that's matter for doing a search and checking a box and looking for uh, those uh, uh, non-commercial use licenses. In fact, Google makes it very easy. It's a drop down button on, in their search category. Uh, unfortunately, this is the, this is the we, are, we are all infringers, all of us are. Um, if you tell me you're not, you, you're, I guarantee that you are. Um, and the thing about, about it is, uh, like I said before, copyright is, on, is only gonna be enforced by choice by the owner and the owner chooses to ignore it, you're free and clear. Uh, 
Um, so an another way you can actually get into trouble is by contributory infringement is just causing somebody else to infringe. So um, uh, this happens with in many cases with uh, say you have somebody create your website for you um, and they put in works uh, somebody they, they they incorporate photographs or images or whatever else of third parties without permission they've contributed to your infringement because once that website goes live you're the owner of that website uh, uh, but you didn't create that infringement because you assumed that the whoever created that website for you would have known uh, how to uh, do that uh, properly but if they didn't or didn't keep their receipts <laughs> that could be an infringement violation in fact i had that happen where a client was sued for the photograph that was embedded um, uh, inadvertently. Uh, however, uh, uh, the owner actually did buy that uh, photograph that was in there, uh, well, uh, the website developer, but the person who owned the website didn't want to deal with it and just shut down the site without letting him actually show uh, the, uh, the receipt. Uh, and that would have been, uh, would have gotten them out of out of trouble. So, uh, but he would have been sued for contributory infringement for knowingly causing the third part his uh, uh, his client uh, to infringe somebody else's copyright. So, uh, vicarious infringement is basically infringement party control. Uh, so, basically, an employee, if you're an employer, an employee uh, infringes copyright. Well. Guess what? You're, you should have you had control over that person, um, and uh, that would bring you into infringement. So, um, what happens in, if somebody does go to court uh, in, in an infringement case? Um, if it does go to court, and generally most things do not go to court. Um, uh, if you end up do going to court for copyright infringement, basically it's a failure of negotiation. Uh, so very few cease and desist letters actually do end up in court, but the ones that do, the court can order the impounding of allegedly infringing articles. Uh, so, you know, these, you'll see these more with uh, larger cases where there's, you know, millions of dollars of uh, products at stake. Uh, and basically if it's, um, if articles are impounded uh, after, infringement is proven, the court can order the destruction of those goods. Um, now, all of these are actually assuming that you have um, registered the copyright with the Copyright Office. In fact, if you file a copyright claim in court and there is no copy register registration in, in the US, uh, the court will stay the litigation until the registration comes through. Uh, and even then, uh, recent court cases have said that you will only collect damages for infringement that happens after the registration process. So you need to be really careful that if you intend to be making money or profiting from a particular work, that you get the registration done sooner rather than later. Um, because if you do go to court, uh, or even if you send a cease and desist letter, telling the other side that you have a registration means that they're on the hook for damages uh, as of the date of that registration. So hopefully that happens before you send that cease and desist letter out. Um, but if copyright infringement is uh, proven, then the copyright owner is entitled to recover at their um, choice, actual damages and profits or statutory damages not less than 750 or more than 30,000 for each infringement. And the court may trouble this, trouble this if this is well, that means three times as much if they find that it's willful. So um, for example, uh, the record industry for a while there before the, uh, while the internet was uh, coming into being, uh, was pretty aggressively enforcing people downloading music and sharing music uh, and the poster child case for this was um, um, a single mom who had uh, 
uh, I, I forget the service now, uh, but she, her, her computer had, she downloaded a, an, uh, about a thousand songs on her, on her computer. Uh, and that they could, uh, they showed that her computer was accessed about a thousand times for each song by other people. So the copyright infringement, when they did the calculation running out, it was even at the minimum, they, uh, the record industry uh, selected chat statutory damages at the lowest amount, $750 for each infringement. So 750 times a thousand times a thousand times. Uh, and she lost on appeal. Single mom, I think uh, the uh, treble damages and attorney's fees, the ACLU helped her with her appeal, couldn't get anywhere. Um, now the record industry never collected from her, but the point they made was don't sell, steal our stuff. Uh, the record industry, um, of course, probably never recovered in terms of its reputation as far as that goes. And they're still losing out to, uh, well, now in the days of Spotify and things like that, there's other ways to, to be able to, uh, recover, um, uh, uh, royalties and such, but before Spotify, uh, and the services that, are, that exist now, there was no way to stop people from sharing, um, music and basically collecting royalties. Uh, but yeah, uh, it was tens of millions of dollars, uh, and there was no way that uh, they collected it. But that wasn't the point. They made an example of her. Um, so yeah, so, and the court may award attorney's fees. Uh, and there are some limited criminal charges for copyright infringement, but those are almost never um, applied. They're generally limited to piracy, uh, and basically people, uh, uh, deliberately, you know, making pirate copies of things. Uh, and, and generally those are in, in enforced by the FBI, but so if it's a, you know, small case here or there, they're not, they're not going to come into play. Uh, the resources of the FBI are better placed elsewhere. So you get a cease and def desist letter. How do you prove that, you know, what are your defenses? Um, so what what is what is it what does there have to be for infringement to exist or for copyright to exist? Um, so remember what I said before was uh, there has to be independent creation. So if somebody sent you a cease and desist letter, J.K. Rowling sent a cease and desist letter uh, from you know author random author X. What the heck is she going to say? She's like, well, I've never seen your work. I created this separately. I had no access to it. That is a defense. That's an absolute defense. Even if um, you know a thousand monkeys uh, on a thousand typewriters typing out the works of Shakespeare, uh, if they were human, <laughs> uh, would uh, have uh, independent copyright over Shakespeare. Uh, and <laughs> there was, in fact, a case you you may have all heard about this. Uh, about the uh, National Geographic photographer who left his camera lying around in the Amazon jungle and a baboon came along and pushed the button and took a selfie. Uh, who owns the copyright? Was it the cameraman, the photographer who left his camera on the, uh, in, the, uh, in the jungle or was it the baboon? Uh, and in fact, in that case, uh, the courts basically said there is no copyright in that work uh, because it requires a human agent for copyright to attach itself because the laws of man don't apply to nature in quite the same way. <laughs> um, so, uh, in fact, the author, the, the photographer, the guy who owned the camera did try to assert copyright infringement uh, uh, when that picture went viral uh, and basically lost because he didn't create the work himself. Um, uh, so that's a, a bit of a digression, but, uh, if somebody sends you a cease and desist letter for something you've created without having seen anything else, that is, and you can show it, then that is, uh, absolute defense to copyright infringement. It is not copyright infringement to create something that is identical to something else without having seen it. Uh, it is copyright infringement if you copied 
it, but if you didn't copy it, then it's it's not. The, the part of the problem with proving this is that this day and age, if something's on the internet, chances are you may have seen it before. Uh, so it becomes real tough uh, to assert that um, that defense. You do need to make sure that you keep good notes and good good records, uh, especially if you don't have a registration. Um, but if it's a good enough work, register it. And that usually helps. Uh, having a copyright registration is actually uh, puts the ball in the other side's court. So basically, uh, it's it's presumed that you have some right to the work. Otherwise, you wouldn't have filed a registration because when you file a registration, you're actually making assertions to the government that you've created the work yourself and you haven't stolen it and, and such. So if it comes out that you did in fact uh, uh, file a registr registration fraudulently, you could it could be um, further grounds against you in an infringement case. So uh, if it's something you've created that you have some, find some value and go get it registered. So the second defense is an authorized license. I actually told you one instance where this happened, where uh, the uh, uh, my client was the web, web developer who did actually get a license to insert a photograph in the web in the web page, uh, and then the owner of the web page was sued for co for season for copyright infringement. Well, in fact, there was no infringement because the web developer actually had a license to use that uh, use that image. Uh, mistake can be an infringement it can be a defense if you intended to actually use something that you did have not authorization to use or was independently created but you just put in the wrong file for example that happens uh it was like oh no no harm no foul uh there was no infringement and that happens from time to time a fair use defense is very 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 limited uh and what does fair use I'll come in. Fair use comes in uh, really for uh, First Amendment commentary, um, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. Uh, so, if you're uh, education purposes, things like that, then yes, fair use will will come in. Um, but if you are just if you if you whether or not you are uh, doing something for commercial purposes. Uh, versus no uh, nonprofit doesn't help as much. Uh, saying that you've created something in homage to something else does not mean you're not infringing somebody's copyright. So the fair use defense says, yes, I have infringed your copyright. Yes, I acknowledge that, but but it's excusable because I'm doing it for commentary, criticism, reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. For almost any other reason, it is not a defense. It, it is just not available to you. Um, because generally, um, copyright owners uh, have essentially the ball in their court because usually where the infringement happens tends to be in social media uh, where the, the the platforms themselves are structured to because the platforms themselves do not want to fight again in the middle of these in of these cases basically defer to the owner of copyright uh, to give them uh, the leeway to take down things that are not theirs so from your perspective if you if your work is being said to be infringing of somebody's work in social media, you're not going to win in social media. You're probably going to have to take it down and not put your work up anymore in social media. If you have the work elsewhere, then uh, you may still continue to use it generally because chances are the owners of that war original work aren't going to go after your other works because the scope of their where they make money isn't in those realms so you have to be really careful about uh what your intention is and what you're trying to show and what you put up um and uh claiming that um 
you're doing something in homage is will not protect you from from somebody telling you to take something down. Um, so all these other factors I listed here have come up in various cases um, that have helped, but it, generally the more factors you have, the better, um, and you are not going to be able to see those as being. Um, <laughs> there are very few instances that I've seen that that uh, that rise to the level of fair use. Uh, and I mean, there are there are some, but mostly in the creative realm, not very often. Um, so there there is a parody defense, um, uh, and some of the cases that that talk to talk about parody defenses uh, are very specific where. Uh, there was uh, like so one of the seminal cases was a two life crew, um, a rendition of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman, uh, where uh, uh, two life crew, if you do not know, uh, during in the 80s, <laughs> uh, was basically uh, a gangster rap uh, group that uh, used a lot of very foul language and um, uh, uh, they did a reworking of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman um, that was pretty foul. Um, and uh, uh, Roy Orbison's estate sued Two Life Crew uh, for uh, infringement. Uh, and their defense was parody. Uh, and uh, it was parody and social commentary, First, First Amendment uh, social commentary, because what Two Life Crew did with their what they showed or what their position was, was uh, what they were doing with their lyrics was shining a light on how African-American women are held in a different light and different regard uh, based on just the way that the lyrics were, uh, were arranged to show that the differences between um, African-Americans and, uh, and white people in uh, Roy Orbison's work were shown, and it was it was a it was a very interesting read. You, it is very rare that you will find somebody who does that. I actually just had a call from somebody a week ago, uh, where they had uh, created a, um, um, a a work that was promoting um, um, uh, social awareness of a, of a of a certain issue, but they were using it. Uh, by changing the lyrics to the to the song um, uh, um, all about that bass. Uh, and they got a cease and desist letter because they did not get, she did not get authorization to use that song uh, at all. Um, so uh, by the time she came to me, it was really too late, but she could have used the fair use defense in that case because while it was clear Absolutely clear. As soon as, you, as soon as those lyrics, the, the 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 bass and the rhythm came on, you knew what the song was. But her lyrics were clearly not about all about that bass. It was all about the social uh, uh, light that she wanted to bring bring to uh, bring to uh, bring to bear. However, uh, that is a def as an excuse to infringement, not a defense saying I'm not infringing. She was infringing. She knew it. Everybody knew. It. But it was an excusable infringement because there was a social commentary that needed that was attached to that uh, that, that that allowed her to, to to do that. But it was an infringement. She would still have to take that song off of off the social media if the owner insisted. Uh, she could have done it in other platforms and probably would have won if she went to court. But one, she doesn't have the money for that. Uh, and two, she did have an infringement. And it would have been fair use. But once you tie in social media uh, and those third party platforms who, who basically, uh, rightfully so, are protecting the owners of copyright. Uh, I'm, I'm, you're you're going to have a really hard time making that connection unless you do the steps to make sure that you have permission ahead of time if you want to use social media 
as a platform to, to, to let your art go out there. Um, now, and there, here's the other thing here. So not all, not all educational uses are considered fair use. Uh, so typically, if you are an educator and you make copies of, of works that you distribute to your classroom, that is OK, and that's considered fair use. Uh, but if you're making a curriculum that you're selling somewhere else, uh, that's not considered fair use, and you would need to get permission if you're going to put that put uh, other people's work in a curriculum uh, for educational use. Um, licenses, uh, and I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, ownership of copyright versus ownership of a copyright of work. Uh, the transfer of a material object or copy does not, in itself, transfer any rights. So, you know, buying a copy of a book, buying a copy of a CD. Uh, doesn't transfer the copyright to you. Uh, something you have to be very, very aware of, uh, and this comes up a lot in software, uh, is that uh, you know, there's the, sh the shrink wrap agreement issue. Is if you click a box, you open the, op tear open the package, you're agreeing to limits on how you use a work. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, does that mean we all need to be lawyers to read all the uh, the shrink light licenses? Frankly, I don't, <laughs> uh, and you know, I should know better. But honestly, um, I don't have the, that kind of time. <laughs> um, the The upshot of that is, um, if you're purchasing a product and you're using it for your personal use and not giving it up or giving it to somebody else, you're not going to be in any trouble for the most part. But as soon as you start taking bits and pieces of work that you've purchased uh, or used and incorporating them into other works, then those terms of use issues come up. Um, and for for software and images and things like that, you can actually find um, works that you can use for non-commercial purposes, again, very easily on the internet. Uh, and I, like I said, Google makes that very easy in your, in your search terms. Just there's a there's a box up there, a drop down menu that that you can find these things. But uh, if you are using or incorporating anyone's work, you're going to save yourself so much trouble by going to the source first and asking for um, permission. And if you can't find the source and you can't find the um, um, original author, find something else. I mean, seriously, is this day and age, uh, with with the internet uh, being what it is, you can find anything. <laughs> you got the sum total of human knowledge at your fingertips. Use it. Uh, there is there is nothing that is so sacrosanct that you can't find something that's good enough. Uh, else, uh, some of these other things, uh, you know, number of uh, licenses and number of computers and things like that. Uh, that's all, uh, uh, you know. Look at the terms of whatever license you're looking at, and seeing if you know that you match up, that you're doing what you've agreed to do when you've purchased that thing, whatever that is. So um, when you go on to any social media, um, so one of the, um, I, I talked about contracts a little bit um, earlier, where I said that you don't have to have something in writing um, to have a contract, but you know, when you get on to a website, you actually are, um, and, and the courts say this is okay, uh, that by your use of the website, you're agreeing to the terms uh, that are uh, that are provided to you. You create an account on Facebook, you click past that terms of terms of use, you've accepted them by using the site. Um, so the way for you to not be uh, bound by them is not by po making a post saying, I'm not accepting these terms, because that's not effective, <laughs> because, because your continued use of the site negates any disclaimer that you post on Facebook. I've, I've seen these posts before, and they just baffle me. Uh, the, the grant, the, you, you give the website, the license to use whatever you create, and that includes your posts, your whatever you type, uh, whatever you 
upload from other from you know from your web from wherever you're telling the website that you have the right to post what you post the pictures you put up the art you put up you have that right and you are absolving them of any liability uh for your actions um so um now obviously most people tend to ignore it uh and you will see people sharing and downloading and uh and incorporating other people's things from social media into their own works that is not generally allowable uh, so you really do need to make sure that things that you put up you are okay with losing control of um and the way people generally do try to keep control of that work is of their works is not showing the entire work uh, or showing um lower quality work in terms of pixelation so don't don't put the high res image up put a low quality image or watermarking things or directing people to your website uh, directing people out of social media into wherever your platform is um so uh and I, i've seen a lot of the artists that i follow uh that you know uh ask for attribution uh you know have their followers if they if their followers see some of their works um in social media they'll flag it uh contact the, uh, the original author uh and either demand attribution uh or um that happens more and more it's people are becoming better aware of it but it's it's not it's nowhere near uh good enough um uh so you you really do uh need to be very careful about what what about but your activities and your presence on social media uh and, and and i mentioned this before but you know infringement accusations or take down notices for things you put up uh don't don't ignore those address them quickly um if you have any questions you know contact somebody who would know well me um or uh or um somebody you trust that can help you with these because the worst thing you can do is just not uh answer the um uh the request um i mean it may not help and it may not hurt you outside of the social media platform but it might affect your ability to post to that platform because then you'll be pl flagged as an infringer and you don't want you don't want that um so i've talked about some of these throughout already so what happens if somebody else uh how do you prevent um or limit infringement by others i mean and um you know watermarking uh not placing your full work uh engaging your audience all of those things will help at least mitigate the chance that you're going to be infringed um but you know in the same way that other people can use their infring their tools of infringement to protect their works those tools are available to you as well uh and it's especially true if you've got registered works so if you have a registration for a copyright or a trademark or even a patent uh almost all the platforms amazon uh, uh facebook twitter all of them have um uh, mechanisms for you to register to, to at least record your registration with them uh and then enforce your rights for uh against infringers uh but you know don't don't expect it to be well generally it's it, it can be easy but be prepared for a fight especially if it turns out that you know uh the other work you know uh, is something that people are making money on uh if somebody is profiting from your infringement they will fight <laughs> um and you know um sometimes they will ignore you if it's if it's on a platform social media platform then you know you're okay uh not not okay it pays in the right word but you have at least some recourse to take it down within that site uh but um remember what i said about copyright being uh national in scope if you see your work on alibaba which is the chinese equivalent to amazon good luck <laughs> uh you, you may not get anywhere with that uh because if you don't have a registration in china there's nothing really you can do um one and two um it's infringement in china not in the us so availing yourself of us law isn't going to do any, anything to you 
uh, in the same way, you know, it would be the same thing if that copyright were being done in, in, in Australia or somewhere in Europe, you may have more recourse in those countries because they tend to do, uh, be more likely to um, um, back up uh, the US uh, rules and regulations, uh, but there's no guarantee that that will help. But you are within your right. Um, if you believe that to be infringement to send, tell somebody to stop. Do you have to get a lawyer involved? No. Uh, you can just start out by reaching out to them and saying, hey, start a conversation. Um, and if you're not getting anywhere, then, you know, bring out the big guns. Um, but even then, you know, nine times out of, out of 10, you're just it's not going to be worth um, stopping the infringement. Uh, now, that is not to say that you should basically uh, 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 turn the other cheek if somebody says, oh, you know, this is an infringement. It may be infringement, but you're getting uh, exposure. That's, that's BS. That don't, 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 uh, don't, don't fall for that. That is not, uh, if your work is important enough that, or good enough that they thought that they could use it, then they should be willing to pay for it. Um, that's my opinion anyway. So um, in all of this, um, some of the things you need to think about is, you know, if you, if, if part of what you're creating has elements that look like something else or sound like something else or feel like something else, there is a possibility that you could lose uh, if you went to court uh, on grounds that your work isn't entirely original. Uh, and you may only be able to collect for part of what you think is yours. A really good example was the um, Backdraft uh, case, Backdraft the movie, uh, <laughs> which was about uh, firefighters. Um, and uh, they were sued, um, the movie Backdraft was sued by a uh, screen by an author in Buffalo, New York. Um, and uh, I actually met the attorney who fought on the side of the author uh, where uh, elements of the script that he wrote and pitched to Hollywood, which didn't, it didn't end up getting picked, turned up in Backdraft. And uh, he did not win, he won copyright infringement, but not for the entire script, but for 1% of the script. So he collected copyright infringement damages in the amount of 1% of Backdraft's profits, <laughs> oh, which is interesting. Uh, so you may be, you, you, it may be that if you were to fight an infringement action, that your infringement may only be a percentage of the whole that's being copied. Or, and the flip side is, if you're being sued for infringement, they may not collect the entire amount of your profits. It may just be a small part. Um, so, you know, be, you, consider that. I mean, that, that is, it is, <laughs> it is a, uh, it, it really is a mind, mind bender when you think about some of these things. Uh, and um, you, you get a good lawyer on your side who can show access and you're done. Uh, and there's not much you can do about it. Um, you know, be, be very careful that you understand that you have something in writing uh, if you have somebody create something for you, that you understand that you have at least their assurances or at least a chain of titles showing licenses being transferred to you. You un understand that if you are um, using a work that somebody else created for you that they didn't create themselves, that you may not be able to use that for everything you think you might. Uh, so make it very clear to people who are working for you, uh, whether by contract or as employees, what you want to do so that they may be able to best help you. Um, I can't advise you on, on a course of action if I don't know what your end goals are. 
So you really need to have communication about what it is you're trying to do uh, and make sure that everyone working on a project understands what's happening before uh, before committing to it because you know that might be an issue. Uh, the, the the next one there, someone may be profiting what you're doing. Well, that's a, that that is something that happens, especially with social media. And if if you are creating something that that has value and worth, uh, you know people may be using it and selling it. You might you might end up seeing it on a T-shirt somewhere in, in China. Um, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but you, I have seen instances where uh, people. <laughs> Where, knock, where people will see um, something that's particularly uh, attractive uh, and uh, uh, a screenshot of an item will be produced in slipshot fashion somewhere in Asia. Uh, and there's really a whole heck of a lot you can't do about that. Uh, you know, the biggest thing about any of this is you, you may get sued and you really do need to be careful about what you're doing. Um, especially if you are trying to make make a living on this, and that's 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 just the reality of the system we live in. And um, you know, be careful what you take uh, from the internet. You know, you really don't have the right. If just because something is on there and it's not marked, doesn't mean it's free to take. You generally can assume that uh, it's under somebody else's copyright unless you can see something specifically that says the contrary. Um, you know, if you are taking, if you are taking something that does have uh, limitations on it, make sure you read, understand those terms of use and you follow them. Otherwise, you know, you know go, go find another, find another piece to use. And again, you know, understand your relationship with anyone helping you. So, um, that's about it for my presentation. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. And um, uh, Patrick did send me a couple of emails earlier uh, that I want to address with some questions. Um, OK, here's one question. I'm a visual artist and writer. In the event of a copyright dispute, can our private files and data serve as proof of copyright ownership? Or is it legally registered copyright the only legally recognized defense of ownership? Well, and like I said before, uh, registration is not required for something to be uh, protected by copyright. However, good records do help. So yes, um, your private files and data can serve as proof of ownership, especially if they have dates associated with them. Um, and you know, this is actually something similar that we do in, in the patent field is what we periodically do with in terms of um, uh, notes or records or uh, uh, things like that is or de developing um, uh, whatever if we have an inventor notebook we periodically have uh, the the author and then a witness sign those notebooks um, so if you've got something like that for if you're if if the work that you're creating is of the type that allows you to have a witness great that would be ideal if not uh something with a date or a timestamp uh is is much better than nothing at all but registration is not required uh but if it's important enough work you should just get it registered um uh so that that's something to consider uh the second email i got was uh, okay, I am specifically interested in copyright as it pertains to ownership of original imagery. I'm considering reproducing artwork for sale, and I'd like to make sure I correctly copyright the original image, such that if I wished I could sell the original but still be able to sell reproductions of that image. Um, okay, um, also to make it clear that no one else would have permission to reproduce it. So um, if you create an original work, uh, you have the right to make copies uh, and selling those copies does not transfer the copyright. Nobody else has the right to make those make copies of the work they just sold unless you specifically give them the right to do so. Uh, now, if you're making reproductions of somebody else's work, you need to have rights to make that reproduction in the first place. 
Um, and you don't need to tell anyone that because that is basically what the law says. Uh, now, th that said, I did say that uh, educating your customer base and your and your uh, uh, your followers is always a good thing. Engaging with them is always a good thing. Uh, so starting that conversation about what is allowable and what is allowed uh, is good to have. Um, and, and usually the part of the problem is most lay people are not aware of what, those, what the limitations of the law are. So it, 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 if you need to have that conversation with somebody who's buying your work, sure, by all means do so and make sure and have it in a, in a way that's easy for them to understand. Uh, you do not need legalese uh, to how, tell people not to copy something. Um, so, you know, be aware of that. Uh, but yeah, the law basically says if, if it's your original imagery, the copyright is yours uh, and it will not transfer to anyone else without something in writing specifically saying so. So you can make copies, sell those copies, uh, and you can't control what people do with those copies so they can dispose of those copies any way they wish, other than making more copies, because that's a copyright violation. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's all questions that I had. Patrick, do you see anything on there? Look in the uh, chat function on there. There's a couple questions in there. All right, let me see if I can open that up. Oh, yeah, I see some. I'm the verbose one, and I apologize for not getting these questions to you ahead of time. They just didn't pop into my head until now. And oh, no, that's totally fine. Yeah, usually when we do this presentation, uh, you know, there's people will, will uh, come in and a answer questions. And I prefer that. Um, so anyway, let's read this question. And welcome to not answer the following. <laughs> um, does registering a copyright in the U.S. provide copyright protection in other countries? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. Um, you're not, uh, there is an international treaty called the Berne Convention uh, that you could use to, um, uh, to uh, apply uh, in, in related countries. The rules in each country and how they apply them vary. Uh, in general, it's generally not um, uh, a huge deal because frankly, the United States tends to be the biggest market. Um, so if you're in the U.S. and you got a U.S. registration, it really, really is all that matters. Uh, and I wouldn't bother with any specific country unless it becomes an issue. Um, the, the problem is that the terms of copyright in the U.S. versus other countries vary significantly. So you need to go to each country individually to figure out what, what's important. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, the next question here. The musician has not obtained a cover license from a song's copyright holder or publisher. Uh, the musician posts a cover song on YouTube and does not try to monetize it, does YouTube licenses. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, you have to comply with YouTube's terms of use. Uh, and if you don't have permission or license from the original uh, um, uh, copyright holder, whether or not you're monetizing it, that's still an infringement. Uh, cover bands are infringements of the original author's work. I mean, there's, there's just no two ways about it. It's just in general that um, uh, the owners of those copyrights tend not to be able to enforce them mainly because of tradition rather than the law. Because under the law, they could enforce uh, cover bands, uh, your copyrights against cover bands just don't. Uh, when you, the, the, the thing about YouTube is that it is, if you're a good cover, you could potentially make quite a bit of money through ads and things like that. So um, you are better off getting permission, getting a blanket license, which you can very easily on their websites. Uh, and, and frankly, the record industry, I mean, I've, I've gone on their websites, it's a matter of checking boxes for what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. And um, you can get permission rather easily. And if that's an issue, you should go ahead and just do that. The fees are not, uh, it, it's a scale, It's a scale. the fees are on scale. So depending on what your use is, uh, you pay more or less. Uh, and I can't tell you what that is because they change all the time. Understood. Actually, there's a company now that is out offering cover licenses for a yeah. lifetime for nine. There you go. 
Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Uh, since Facebook does not compensate publishers as a musician's posting of record cover. Yeah, well, legal, yeah, it does. For the same reason I talked about before. Um, you know, it, it is an infringement and they can choose to enforce it or not. And generally they don't if it's, there's no money attached to it. But if it's on YouTube where it is monetizable, you tend to get into issues. Okay. Uh, next question here. I'm, um, I am aware I'm the only person in the who has purchased license from ASCAP BMI CSAC to allow him to live stream songs uh, as Tom Weber. I don't know if they would agree to negotiate with the group of multiple independent license, but understand at least CSAC may be considering this. Now, the pros are open to a group license. Do you know if your organization, can, oh, well, actually this is a question for, um, for Patrick. Um, Correct. It's an interesting uh, question, yeah. I, I, I don't mean to put you on a spot in any way, Patrick. I just wondered if that's something that, that, you know, if it comes up, if there was an interest on the part of a group of independent musicians who, you know, could not uh, individually or as a group legally sign a license or an agreement, is that something that your organization might consider? You know, that's um, that's probably more of a conversation for my board than than just myself as executive director. So if that uh, comes up, maybe you could send it over via email as, a, as something to consider. But anytime we're moving into something that, you know, potentially has a liability for our agency. It's, it's a conversation bigger than just me and, and the staff. Oh, I understand. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I do know somebody uh, uh, very well. I, uh, who actually is a, bit, a music business client of mine out of Nashville who works with CSAC and we've been, been initiating that conversation. If something were to come from it, I would write up, uh, you know, the information and send it to you. I would, I would caution, however, that those licenses are uh, specific to whoever signs them. I'm not sure if the if Erie Arts and Culture could sign on behalf of other creatives. Very so good point. That would be different. Good. Jonathan, thank you so much for your help. You're very welcome. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank Jonathan for his time and being so gracious with not just that, but also his knowledge and insight. Um, I think that you covered a, a depth of information today that I, I hope uh, everybody walks away with um, a deeper understanding of, of their intellectual property rights as creatives uh, in our community. Um, so again, Jonathan, thank you. And then thank everybody who attended today. Uh, this video will be posted on our blog as a ongoing resource if you ever need to um, refer back to anything. So again, Jonathan, thank you. Yeah, my contact information is on that first and last slide. Uh, if you need, it, need me, just reach out. All right. Well, everybody have a good evening.